Good morning, Crossbridge Church, and welcome to our online service. We are so happy that you're here to join us this Sunday morning. Today, we are continuing our current series called The Last Three, which is a series based on the Gospel of Mark. So we hope that you guys follow us along for this new series. And in a moment, we're going to hear from Pastor Sam. But before we do, we just want to let you know, if you haven't downloaded the app quite yet, it's time to do so. There you can get connected with us, with us in so many different ways for future events coming up, as well as our ministries. Church, we are looking for volunteers. So if you have it in your heart to volunteer within one of our ministries, you can go ahead and email me at Daphne at CrossbridgeMiami.com and I'll find a way to get you connected with the ministry that you would love to help out in. Church, that's all for today. So now let us worship together. Church, I want you to sing this chorus with me real quick. It goes, oh, Christ be magnified. And oh, Christ be magnified. Let his face arise, Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified, let his face arise, Christ be magnified in me. Creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry. Then from north to south and east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified. Were the whole earth echoing his eminence, his name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops, we'd hear Christ be magnified. Oh, be magnified. Sing it all, Christ be magnified, let his praise arise, Christ be magnified in me. Sing it all, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. Every creature, when every creature finds its inmost melody, and every human heart is native cry, then you would in should him a place we sing Christ be magnified. Sing it all, Christ be magnified, let his praise arise, Christ be magnified in me. We're singing it all, Christ be magnified, for the altar of my life, oh Christ be magnified in me. I won't bow. No, I won't bow to idols. I'll stand strong and worship you. If it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. And I won't be formed by feelings. I'll hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, you can hang me there with you. 
Because death is just a doorway into resurrection life. If I join you in your suffering, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, oh, my heart will still be singing. Yes, my song will be the same. Oh, Christ be magnified. Just let His praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. We're crying, oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Oh, Christ be magnified in me. Sing this out, church. And oh, Christ be magnified. Let His praise arise. Christ be magnified. In me we sing, oh, Christ be magnified, the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. And I exalt thee, I the church. I exalt Thee. I exalt Thee. I exalt Thee. Oh, Lord. Let's sing. We exalt. And we There's nothing 
The book of Mark chronicles the last three years of Jesus here on earth. They were pretty intense years, to say the least. Since meeting John the Baptist, he was faced with temptations in the desert, performed miracles, healed people, gained followers, was transfigured, and died. A criminal's death. Only to be raised from the dead. 
What should all these matter for you and I? Join us for The Last Three. Well, hey, today we're in episode two of a series that we've launched uh, this year, 2022, a series based out of the gospel of Mark called The Last Three. We're going to go through the whole uh, letter of John Mark as he writes and he records the reports of, of Jesus' amazing ministry. Uh, last week, we heard from the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Uh, today, we're going to hear from some different voices as I'll bring out a couple of things and why it's important to be beloved children of God and secondly, why it's important that he desires to make us fishers of men. So if you're watching us from Facebook or YouTube, go ahead and click like, share, subscribe. And if you have your Bibles, turn, to, turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, as I'll be reading from verses 9 through 20. Here's what God's Word says to us. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me and I will make you and become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Now the Gospel of Mark records uh, this scene here of Jesus being baptized. And maybe you've read this before and you've asked yourself, why would Jesus ever need to be baptized? Well, it's the same question that John the Baptist had. And what's significant about this scene here is that, again, people are coming out to be baptized because they are acknowledging that they're broken sinners and that this baptism was a public acknowledgement of that. But Jesus wasn't a sinner. Jesus didn't need forgiveness. Jesus here uh, doesn't need to repent. And so why in the world does Jesus need to be baptized? There are a lot of reasons for this, but the main reason, I, I believe, is that Jesus wants to publicly show, publicly display his identification with his people in their struggle with sin, precisely because he's not a sinner. And he takes on the same symbol that people around him take in order to indicate to them and in order to indicate to us, not that he needs forgiveness, but that he's going to provide for us the forgiveness that we desperately Need So that the sins that you hope nobody discovers, that uh, a sin that causes you deep, deep shame, that sin that causes you deep humiliation, your greatest offenses, Jesus says, hey, I want to take those from you. I want to carry your burdens. The fear that you have that your sins would put you right outside of the reach of God here. The one you think that no one can heal, that no one can forgive, no one can you know, set you free from. Jesus says, I want to take your sins from you. I want to put it on myself. And so you see the question uh, you've really been asking is, can Jesus really set me free from this particular sin? Listen to what John the Baptist writes right before Jesus comes to be baptized. He says this in John's Gospel. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Church, listen to what Jesus is saying through his word here because he was baptized with the baptism of sinners and because he's identifying himself with you, the ugly, despicable, shameful, ugly, extreme sins that you've committed so that one day he, he's identified with you so that one day when you stand before the Father and the evil one is licking his, shop, uh, you know, licking his chops, uh, wanting to display your sins to the rest of the world, the Father looks down and he says, I don't see any sins. 
What I see is light. What I see is life because his sins or her sins have been born on the back of my son. You don't see anything because my child has placed their faith in Jesus over his sin or over her sin. Let me ask you something. Do you think it would help you as a Christian in your Christian journey to know that Jesus has identified himself with your struggle as close as he can possibly identify himself with? To know that he uh, would help you if you felt that he was closely identified with you and so near that it, it seems like that he was dealing with the struggle himself. You think that would help you? I think it would help me. It definitely would help me. Where does Jesus draw the strength? Where does he draw the strength to take on this challenge to become the ultimate hero of our souls? Well, first... He knows, and we need to learn this too, we need to learn that the Father adores the Son. Verse 17, notice he says, this is my beloved Son. Jesus lived like an ordinary guy for about three decades. We don't know a lot about his youth, but what we do know is that like almost all Jewish boys in the culture, Jesus learned his father's trade. Jesus had to learn Hebrew scriptures in the synagogue, right? Learning along his peers. One thing is clear, he didn't live like some sort of superman. This, this guy was an ordinary person. He lived an ordinary life, an ordinary young boy who grew up to be an ordinary young man. But something extraordinary happened on the day of his baptism as he received an extraordinary revelation while emerging from the waters and hearing a voice proclaiming him beloved. And this is important. To know that we are beloved by God is important because in this life we're going to come face to face with a lot of different hardships that are designed to test our faith. And if we don't know that we are God's beloved children, when we face these battles, these battles are going to look like a, 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 a form of rejection from our Heavenly Father, a form of cold-heartedness from Him. They're going to feel like God has left you behind in, a, in the midst of a thousand problems and we'll spend the rest of our lives trying to prove our worth and earn our belovedness through a performance and achievement or through sex or through 10 million other things that are constantly ruled by fear, that are constantly ruled by the opinions of others longing and yearning for somebody, anybody to notice me. And we think because we're adults now that we're, yeah, we're beyond these issues, right? But there's a place in every single one of our hearts that are still yearning, still desiring for something we've never received, to hear the voice of God say, you are my beloved child. Listen to how important this was to John when he writes this in 1 John chapter 5. He says, and we have seen and know by personal experience that the Son of God has actually come to this world and has given us understanding and insight so that we may progressively and personally know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, believers, dear ones, guard yourselves from idols, false teachings, moral compromises, and anything that would take God's place in your heart. Here's the second thing that he knows and that we need to learn. Not only they see the beloved son, but he, the father, accepts the son. He's accepted. Uh, finally, the voice says, I am well pleased with this beloved son. This word means I approve. Now, if you're a parent and you have kids, you know that your kids, not all, they don't always grow up to be exactly what you wanted them to be. They don't always grow up to dress how you want them to dress and look how you want them to look. They don't exactly uh, uh, grow up in a way that you know, you can find yourself approving of your ideals for their lives. But this is not true of Jesus. This is the Son who is the perfect reflection of the Father. And it's because of that that the original, the primal, the deepest, the foundational joy of God is the joy He has in His own perfection as He sees them reflected in His own Son. And so if we were to do this, if we were to come in, in front of a mirror and we would consider uh, uh, and look and stare in front of a mirror, we would consider that to be you know, vain. Uh, we would consider that to be conceited and selfish because we were created for something infinitely better than, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 deeper than self-contemplation and taking selfies in the bathroom in front of your mirror. We were created for something deeper, something, something greater. We were created for the contemplation and enjoyment of God. And so why is that important to know? Again, 
because in life we're going to come face to face with a thousand problems in a thousand different ways. We need to be guided by God. And the only way we can step out into the wilderness with supreme confidence is knowing that we have a Father that has set His affection on sinners on us precisely because He has infinite regard for His Son Jesus. Some of you may be asking, some of you may have asked this past Christmas season, how can God love me? How can God love somebody like me? Well, I'll tell you why. Because it's through the death of Christ that God restores all of the imperfections that our brokenness reflects. This is the bedrock of our redemption. This is the fountain of our joy. This is uh, 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 because the Father has loved His Son, the image of His own glory, with infinite and perfect uh, energy for all eternity. And not just the Father, but we see here the triunity that is God. The Holy Spirit gets in on some of this. He descends in a form of, the, uh, of a dove and He says, Hey, I approve as well. And because of this, God in all of His perfections can look at you, can smile and say, Hey, I approve of you as well. This is what gave Jesus supreme confidence to go on into His journey. This is what led Him to go on all the way to the cross, knowing that He was adored, knowing that He was accepted by His Father. And it's at the cross that Christ bears the mark of a tested hero who died for you, who died for me, that He might give the righteousness that we're desperately chasing and we're desperately going after in order, for, for, in order to make us wholly acceptable to His Father, to God, so that we, we may hear the words one day too, You are my beloved Son. You are my beloved daughter, who I am well pleased. And that's the best thing that we're ever going to receive. And so now Jesus has been baptized. He's commissioned for ministry, for his mission. And the very first thing that Jesus did after being baptized was to step into the jungle and be tested by one who's prowling like a lion looking to devour him. And he did this. This is important. This exchange here that happens 40 days in the wilderness, this exchange uh, uh, that he has with being tempted by Satan is that Jesus shows us that he is the ultimate hero of our souls, that as a man, he redeems us from the curse of sin and death, like Paul talks about in, in the book of Romans when he compares the, the disobedience of Adam and the obedience of Christ, indicating that the obedience of Jesus establishes for us a righteous status in the eyes of the Father. Where Adam failed when he was tested in paradise by the devil himself, Jesus succeeds. Life was easy in the garden, but not so in the desert. It's not a friendly environment. Adam enjoyed being nurtured and fed by the trees, having his wife as company, but we see here Jesus is completely alone. He fasted for 40 days. Adam failed even though he had everything going for him, but Jesus succeeded even though, humanly speaking, the odds were stacked against him. And this is for our benefit. This is for us. And it benefits us because Jesus gets tested here in different moments of his 40-day uh, experience with different facets of testing and different uh, facets where, where we all fail and where he succeeds. Which leads us to the second thing here. Right after he gets tempted in the wilderness, right after what, what I call ministry prep 101, a.k.a. the desert, we see here fishers of men. This is what he desires to make us. Professional fishermen couldn't afford to, to, to be quitters or complainers. Professional fishermen, they had to have great patience, they had to have great energy, great stamina, great tenacity. And the phrase that Jesus uses here, fishers of men, was not anything new. It was a phrase that philosophers and teachers would use to describe in a way that through their teaching and through persuasion they could capture people's minds. You gotta be patient when you go fishing. When you go fishing, you can't yell at the fish because they don't jump out of the water and onto your hook. What are you doing? You can't do that. It takes great patience. You've got you to sit there. You've got you to make time to go fishing. You've got to have fresh bait to go fishing. And so here are four ordinary fishermen just living their ordinary life, and they get caught in Jesus' net, teaching us this, that when we give God our ordinary life, here's what he gives us in return. He gives us an extraordinary life calling. And these four guys, they respond with a don't look back kind of faith, leaving their nets to follow Jesus. 
Now, this doesn't mean that God is always going to take you out of your current occupation, out of your current job, and you know, make you into some superstar missionary, some no-name you know, location on this earth. But what it does mean is that right where you are, Right where we are, we can follow him, and he promises to make us into a missionary people. Listen to how Daniel describes it. Those who are wise, he says in Daniel chapter 12, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The greatest work in all the world, winning souls. It's the greatest work that you're ever going to do. And we can do it right where we are in your neighborhood, in your school, in your job. If you're like Daniel in the lion's den, you can do it right where you are. And here are some strategic ways that we also can capture people's minds with the gospel. First, we got to become casters, menders, and adapters. Casters, menders, and adapters. Simon and Andrew were spending a whole long night fishing by the Sea of Galilee. We see here uh, verse 16, and then Jesus goes on. And he sees another couple of guys in the boat mending their nets here in verse uh, 19. And the word mending here has the idea of strengthening, preparing. And so while Simon and Andrew spent a long night not giving up, not being satisfied with the catch that they had, James and John were making preparations to secure fish that would be caught the next day. And so what do we see here? On the one hand, you have fishermen who were concerned with catching more fish. And on the other hand, you had fishermen who were more concerned about maintaining the catch. And it's no different in ministry. In ministry, you have people who've determined, you know what, I'm going to go out, I'm going to share the gospel, I'm going to talk to people every opportunity that I have. And if that's you and you're wired that way, God bless you. Use your gifts. Use your gifts for God's glory. But we also need people who care for and minister to people who are born into the family of God. Somebody's got to feed them. Somebody's got to nurture them in ways of Jesus so that they can grow in him. And sometimes that's going to take a lot of adaptation. It's going to take a lot of adaptation when we step out in, uh, in faith and perform a task that we're unfamiliar with. These four men, they stepped out in faith and to perform something. They were open to change. They were open to learning new things. And we too got to be willing and able to adapt because God is always going to take you into places and in uncharted territories and uncharted waters, places that we're not uh, uh, familiar with. Are we willing to step out in faith and reach out and nurture the next generation? Generation selfie, probably a, 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 a generation that embraces change, definitely the most diverse generation, probably the most informed uh, uh, generation. Are we willing to reach out to them? A, a, a generation that has a strong knack and a strong ability to adapt because most likely because of technology. Are we willing to, to tweak and, and, and change in how we quote unquote do church in order to become better fishermen? Or are we just going to use the same old bait year after year? If so, some of you have to actually go out to where the fish are. You have to actually go out to where they are. You have to participate in the work that they're already doing, learning that our mission is not just to shape the, ne the next generation, but also to be shaped by them. Because watch this. This next generation is the first generation ever in this country to be raised in a post-Christian generation. Where the gospel of God, like Mark says here in verse 14, is no longer the mainstream message. And, and so we use every situation to participate in this calling and to preach the gospel, to talk to somebody about Jesus. That's what Jesus did. And he did it in rhythm. He did it in rhythm. Jesus used a well of water to talk to uh, someone who was thirsty. Jesus used bread to speak to a hungry multitude of people. Jesus uh, used sea to talk to farmers, money to talk to merchants, fish to talk uh, uh, to fishermen, ordinary experiences in life to get the message out. What about us? Are we doing the same? Secondly, we got to become models, mentors, and we got to be decisive. Now, a little timeline here. About a year has passed between Jesus being baptized and he coming out and approaching these four guys, meaning that they knew who Jesus was. Jesus, it's not like Jesus was a stranger and he was calling out to them and all of a sudden they were drawn to him like a magnet and, you know, they started levitating towards him because, you know, they didn't understand. Well, that's not, that's not the case here. They knew who Jesus was. 
They've had convos with Jesus. They've probably have gone into the town and said, hey, you know, but pass by the carpentry shop, say, what's up? You know, they know who he is. They've associated with Jesus and his ministry. But here, as Jesus begins his ministry, they decide to follow him. And what's amazing here is that Jesus is calling for himself fishermen to be his disciples. He's not going out to the synagogues. He's not recruiting the best and the brightest. And it's not that these fishermen were unintelligent. It's that these, these were not the kind of men you would think a king would collect. And their response here tells us a lot about the nature of being a disciple. A lot about what disciple really is. A disciple of Jesus loses his or her life in becoming a disciple, allowing themselves to be mentored by the greatest teacher ever known. Now, we understand that we're not our own, like the apostle says. We are not our own. We belong to Jesus. We're to live our life in the ways of Jesus. Our problem is that we want self-governance. Our problem is that we want to be in control. Our problem is that, you know, and by the way, some of these, they're not bad things that we want, you know, to to have some kind of self-autonomy and control. So that's not bad things. It becomes a bad thing and a big problem when it comes to being in relationship to Jesus. Because it's a relationship we can't control. It's a relationship that we should be in, uh, or rather, uh, a relationship that we are controlled by him, to let him in every aspect of our life. And here's why you should do this, because the reality is we're never going to be fulfilled. We're, gonna, we're never going to find complete joy. We're never going to experience genuine happiness apart from complete submission to the Lord. So he tells him, hey, guys, I know you've been catching fish the whole night, but I got something greater for you to do. They're probably like, what's greater than fishing? He says, I'm going to call you to preach the gospel, to preach about the kingdom, and you're going to use the gospel as nets, and you're going to capture people's minds. And they're like, what? Okay. And they immediately, the text says here, immediately followed him. Listen, preaching the gospel isn't easy. It's hard. Fishing is hard. Preaching the gospel is sometimes uh, threatening. It calls for skill. Sometimes you're going to be rejected Probably why some of us are tentative to share the gospel. We don't like being rejected. But remember that Jesus here accomplishes the work. He doesn't say, follow me and you'll become automatically. He says, follow me and I'm going to make you. He promises to make us into something. He promises here to change us, to make us soul winners. Because by nature, we just want to stay home and watch Netflix. We don't want to go out and preach to anybody. But the voice of the Sea of Galilee will always call us to do something greater than we did yesterday or last week or the year prior. Continually growing as his disciples, modeling the gospel of God, looking for ways to connect in what USA Today calls the loneliest generation. Listen to this quote by Oswald Chambers as he says this about discipleship. He says, The show business, which is so incorporated into our view of Christian work today, has caused us to drift far from our Lord's conception of discipleship. It is instilled in us to think that we have to do exceptional things for God. We have not. We have to be exceptional in ordinary things, to be holy in mean streets, among mean people, surrounded by sordid sinners. This is not learned in five minutes. So what if our church would would prioritize opportunities to reach out to young people, to have meaningful relationships with them, to have meaningful relationships that would mentor them in the ways of Jesus, to to develop and explore new uh, missional models to help young people strengthen, strengthen their faith beyond social media, beyond the screen, I call them screenagers, beyond all of that, to develop real meaningful relationships that also helps them build uh, uh, for their future. And again, this is something that requires patience and energy and stamina because this isn't something that happens overnight. So I pray. I pray like Jesus, we can, we can show a strong desire in bringing different people from different generations, from different everywhere, to bringing different people together, becoming strategic relationship builders with the gospel of God. Wouldn't you agree? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gospel of Christ and that in him I have forgiveness of sins. Thank you for the word of truth that explains the gospel of God, that it is only when we turn from our sin and believe in Christ as the promised Messiah of Israel and Savior of the world that we can be reconciled back to you. 
Thank you that Jesus, the power of God and the wisdom of God, thank you that those who believe in him, and thank you that your promises to your beloved children will all be fulfilled at the appointed time. Thank you in Jesus' holy and mighty name. Amen. Well, hey, friends, thank you for watching. Uh, go ahead and like and subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And remember, you can join me in person every Sunday at 10 a.m. Thank you for watching.